Hey, it's Jake. Today we're continuing with the Ronnie Carrasquillo story. This is part two, so if you haven't listened to part one yet, you should definitely go back and do that now. So, last episode we ended with Ronnie getting some good news, or what seemed like it anyhow. The court basically told him, we think your sentence of 200 to 600 years may have violated a clause in the Illinois Constitution. That clause, by the way, says, quote, all penalties shall be determined both according to the seriousness of the offense and with the objective of restoring the offender to useful citizenship. Bottom line, Ronnie could now be resentenced. Well, maybe. Last June, there was yet another hearing to figure this all out. It took days. Ronnie's lawyer, Michael Deutsch, brought in over a dozen witnesses to testify about who Ronnie was and is now, about the type of man that Ronnie has become in prison. One of those witnesses was Allie Pruitt, a lawyer and Chicago activist. She talked about Ronnie and the people he'd mentored or inspired. What really has stuck out to me over the years is the positive impact he's left on not only folks who have been incarcerated, but folks who haven't. He has this sort of positive influence and inspiring story. And it's just such a motivator for so many people, for his family, for his friends. The state of Illinois had lawyers there arguing the other side. It's always difficult in a post-conviction proceeding to take what we know today and apply it to a trial proceeding that happened years and in this case, decades ago. The circumstances of the crime, the facts of the underlying crime, those have all been litigated. And as counsel said, we're not here to relitigate the facts of the case. Basically, the state was saying, look, we're not here for a new trial. We're only here to determine if Ronnie Carrasquillo should be resentenced. Now, Ronnie claimed that his sentence was unfair and disproportionate to his crime. But the state then argues... What really matters here is that Ronnie has a shot at release, and as long as he does, well then, the sentence is fair. And that is key to the decision and the key to the analysis here, because Mr. Carrasquillo is eligible for parole. In other words, perhaps 600 years sounds like a long time, but he's eligible for parole, so what's the problem? And the judge basically agrees. What does this mean for Ronnie? Well, it means that he now has to place all of his hopes on getting parole. There's just one problem. When it comes to the parole board, it seems that he can't escape the notoriety of his own story. Ronnie's been in prison for nearly half a century, and he's stuck in a convoluted legal system, a system that perhaps could be gamed by an operator like Bob Cooley, but which was terrifying to a guy like Ronnie, who was trapped inside with no fixer to call. And I gotta tell you, at times, Ronnie's story felt a bit like a Franz Kafka novel. There's a guy, and he's stuck, trying to find his way out of one darkened labyrinth after another. And every time it looks like there might be an exit, the lights flicker out. I'm Jake Halpern, and this is Deep Cover, Mobland. Thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. Morning, Jake. How are you doing this morning? Hey, Ronnie. How are you? Well, here we go again. (laughs) Ronnie's been incarcerated since October of 1976. Back then, Ronnie was a teenager and a gang member. One night, he got involved in a fight. He says he shot off the gun to break things up and accidentally killed an off-duty policeman, a man named Terrence Loftus. Ronnie was sentenced to 200 to 600 years in prison. 
And afterwards, he was sort of stunned. He says it took him years to realize what the sentence would really mean for him. I had to wake up and realize, man, I'm in trouble. He filed some early appeals that went, well, nowhere. And I told my father, don't buy no more appeals. Don't buy no more lawyers. I go to the parole board. They're going to see that you know, I shot this guy from far away. There's no intention in it, and, I, and I'll make parole. Parole. That was Ronnie's big hope. Yeah, sure, maybe he'd gotten slammed on his sentencing, but with good behavior, he hoped he'd get out on parole. So he gradually turned his life around in prison. He renounced his gang membership. He learned a number of trades, got his GED, found religion, became a mentor. He says in so many ways he became a different person. And he figured the parole board would see this, that they'd review the facts of his case and release him. How many times have you been before a parole board? I think 35 times. At least 35 times. Over 30 times Ronnie's gone before the parole board. That's almost once a year. It's kind of like going to the Super Bowl annually and losing every single time. Ronnie just keeps getting told, nope, you're not getting out. Even so, each year or so, when Ronnie comes up for parole, he keeps trying, keeps providing evidence of his rehabilitation and talks about how far he's come. My life has transformed so much from what I came as a a youth. I was a poor student. I was not a bright education-wise, book-wise, none of that. I got my GED, started going to college. I have six, seven different trades. While behind bars, he's worked as an electrician, a welder, a locksmith, a pipe bender, and a washer-dryer repairman. He's also trained to become a typist and a paralegal. He's mentored fellow inmates, given them legal advice. He's coached the prison's baseball team and organized soccer tournaments for his jailmates. He's a pastor, and he's even written a Bible study workbook called Covenant with Abraham. Ronnie is not allowed to attend parole hearings in person, but his supporters are, and they do. They show up and vouch for him. All different kinds, black, white, Latin, whatever, races, different ex-gang members, different, and all of them write letters that I impacted their life. And I've been coaching them in Christianity for the longest. They go, you live your life, go help your mother, go help your family. And this is all I do for my whole uh, 46 years. Over the years, Ronnie has won over a number of supporters, including religious leaders, an alderman, a U.S. congressman, even one of the prosecutors who originally brought the case against him. That prosecutor, Thomas Breen, noted that Ronnie's years of mentoring showed him to be a model for other inmates. Breen went so far as to compare Ronnie to the police officer he killed. He said that Ronnie had, quote, many of the generous characteristics of a caring person, not unlike Terry Loftus. Members of the media have also written about Ronnie's story, tracking his bid for freedom. All of this seems like it might tip the scales in Ronnie's favor, right? The only problem being the parole board itself. It's known in Illinois as the Prisoner Review Board. Now, in theory, it's a neutral body that can reach its own independent verdict. Its members are appointed by the governor. Its ranks include former parole officers, prosecutors, social workers, cops, and politicians. The board operates with virtually no oversight, and its decisions are not reviewable in court. Jorge Montez sat on that parole board for 16 years. I was a law and order and conservative Republican, and I was going to do what all conservative people should do, is keep them all in and uh, not let anybody out. That's what I set out to do. Jorge was a former prosecutor, and he was tough. He wasn't inclined to let many guys out. And then, one day, this one inmate comes up for parole. Jorge says this inmate had a very strong case for being released. But... Jorge still voted no. He said he did it almost automatically, like that's just what he was supposed to do. And then something kind of odd happened. The very conservative Republican chairman told me, Mr. Montes, is there something we're missing here? I said, well, why would that be? You're, you're voting to deny parole for what appears to be a pretty perfect candidate for parole. I said, in that case, I uh, withdraw my motion and I would move that we parole him, and we did. It was almost like, on some level, Jorge was looking for permission to show leniency, to say, you know what? Yeah, this guy does deserve a second chance. 
let him out. And that started my journey on, on these issues. So increasingly, I began to scrutinize cases to really consider whether somebody had changed their lives and, and, and that warranted a second look, a second chance. And increasingly, I began to find that a lot of these people were really redeemable. And my vote started to reflect that. All of that being said, when Jorge first heard Ronnie's case for parole, he says he wasn't persuaded. Not at first, anyhow. Especially given the fact that Ronnie had killed a police officer. Jorge says that he voted against Ronnie a few times. At these hearings, the inmates are not allowed to show up and speak for themselves. Instead, one member of the parole board speaks with the inmate and then presents their case almost like a lawyer, but not really, because the presenters, they may have their own agenda, and they might not advocate for that inmate at all. So maybe you're starting to get what I'm talking about when I say this whole process at times feels like something that Franz Kafka cooked up. Anyway, one day, Ronnie is up for parole yet again. Jorge is still not convinced that Ronnie should be set free. And on this occasion, Ronnie's presenter is, well, I'll just let Jorge explain. There was a gentleman on the board named Dick Doria. And Dick Doria was a sheriff of DuPage County, formerly the sheriff, a hard, conserv- ultra-conservative. So, bad news for Ronnie, right? But wait, because Dick Doria, the conservative former sheriff, when he made his presentation, he said something that really surprised Jorge. And Dick said that it was impossible in his professional opinion that Ronnie would have killed this officer purposefully, uh, intentionally. Impossible. The kind of weapon he used, and Mr. Doria knew all about ballistics and weapons and calibers, and, and he made a, a wonderful presentation. He said, I'm, not, I'm voting to release this man because I think he, he did not intentionally kill the police officer. According to Jorge, Dick Doria said that he looked at the evidence the distances, the ballistics, and the like, and determined it didn't add up. It didn't make sense that Ronnie had killed this cop intentionally. And this really got Jorge thinking, critically, about Ronnie's whole case, about Ronnie's intentions, his efforts to redeem himself, and even about the original sentence back in the 1970s from Judge Wilson and whether it had been fair. In fact, Jorge says he came to feel that Ronnie's sentence of up to 600 years did seem a bit fishy, coming on the heels of the Harry Alamon trial, and that this might be an instance of camouflage bias. Well, it made sense to me that that a judge would behave this way and take it out on poor Carrasquillo because he had just give, given this sn- sniper, who was well known in the community for being a mafioso, he gives him an out. He gives him he, he gives him a pass, and then of course he's got to cover his tracks by then. Uh, uh, overreacting on the Carrasquillo matter. I thought that was an excellent argument, it's, and, and I believe that. We'll be right back. Throughout this process, Ronnie has also faced another big challenge. The Chicago Police Department and the union representing its officers do not want him to get parole. So much so that they have physically showed up at his parole hearings. Jorge remembers this. He says they made quite an impression. The conference room was very tight. And uh, Chicago would send busloads of police officers and they would all crowd in to the conference room that just fit the conference table. And uh, there were all there were 30 cops standing around us. And, and they were looking over our shoulder, and literally. And so as we're casting votes, it was very intimidating and very difficult. I've seen a picture of this scene, and I got to describe it to you. You can see the parole board members sitting at a table, and then, like a foot behind them, is a whole crowd of uniformed officers literally hovering over them. With time, Jorge came to realize that Ronnie might not ever receive enough votes for parole. In fact, at one point, he even wrote an affidavit on Ronnie's behalf. In that affidavit, he said that despite Ronnie's, quote, excellent prison record and his strong family and community support, 
that he was repeatedly denied parole because, quote, the victim was a Chicago police officer. Montez concluded that, quote, there are several members of the board then and now who will never vote for parole when the victim is a police officer. For Ronnie, none of this is encouraging. You know, the Constitution says we have listened. We don't care how much you got of that. We don't care about none of that. You kill a police officer, and they blatantly say, I'm not going to vote for a police killer. So, you know, I'm, I, how can I ask them for mercy when they're telling me before the, the, the hearing's even done? So even if I bring anybody in there to testify of hope or anything like that, we don't want to hear that. And this creates a real logistical challenge for Ronnie. Can he get the votes he needs to be released? Each time Ronnie is up for parole, the board is different. Old members cycle out, new members cycle in. And he's come close a few times. Each one of these moments is seared into his memory. Moments when it seemed like maybe the door was about to swing open for him. In Justice Watch, a Chicago-based nonprofit newsroom has done some excellent reporting on Ronnie's bid for parole. They found that in the years between 2005 and 2008, Ronnie had a series of parole hearings, and each year he came within one vote of winning his freedom. Jorge can still remember these votes, how excitement would build as the board members cast their votes one at a time. For those of us that were favorable to his release, it builds up a lot of momentum and, and expectation, and there's one, there's two, there's three. Oh, we're getting close. I think this is it. He's going to go home. And then we get to no. So that's it, it, it gets very tense. In 2008, Ronnie actually won a majority of votes from the board. Six yeses and five noes. That's a win, right? Nope. The Illinois Prisoner Review Board requires that he get a majority of all members, not just those in attendance. And that day, there were two no-shows and only 13 members on the board at the time. So his six-vote majority, it didn't count. Jorge was the chairman of the parole board at this point. And he says to come this close and to fall short, it was really hard for him personally. You feel deflated and you feel um, demoralized uh, because if you really believe in this and you uh, work is work and you try to keep work away from home, but if you if you believe that it's the right thing to do and that we're keeping somebody locked up, a human being locked up like that, uh, and then you're, you're sympathizing with the family and you see all the tears and you see people leaving devastated, uh, yeah, it impacts it, it, it impact you. Ronnie wasn't there, but he soon got the news. According to my law, I was supposed to be granted parole. I made the majority of the, of the vote. Talk to me, like, what's it like going before the parole board 35 times and, and getting rejected every time? I never go in front of the whole committee. I see one person. One person comes and they call him my hearing officer after that. I don't talk to nobody but this one person. I'm up against an invisible body that I never see. In 2020, Ronnie was up for parole once again, and the event attracted attention from the local press. WGN investigates cop killers going free. Now, another officer's murderer is appealing to the Illinois Prisoner Review Board for freedom. This is a news report from WGN in Chicago that aired in September of 2020, a few weeks before Ronnie was set to appear before the parole board. You might think that killing a cop would lead to an automatic life sentence, but under old sentencing rules, inmates are finding themselves eligible for release. And as we found, it often lands in the laps of deceased officers' families to fight to keep them locked up. The family members of the victim often come to these hearings. It's a tortured process. They talk about how hard it's been for them and how they hope that the killer will not be allowed to just walk away. In the WGN news story about Ronnie, a cousin spoke for the Loftus family. We are aging and we need to speak for him. We need to speak for his parents and for his brother. And they are all gone. I did read an interview with Loftus's brother before he passed away. He told the Chicago Sun-Times that the shooting devastated the family, saying, quote, our mother was never the same after that. The Fraternal Order of Police declined my request for an interview and the Chicago Police Department didn't respond to my request for comment. 
but I did manage to find a web page commemorating Terence Loftus. A number of his friends and fellow police officers had posted messages here. One read, I remember the night he was killed. He was showing me his new green leather jacket in the tactical office. A few hours later, he was shot. I remember seeing him later at the hospital with a breathing tube in his mouth and the sounds of the air machine pumping in a steady rhythm. That vision to this day has haunted me and will until the day I die. Unlike the reprobate that killed him, Terry was an honorable and exceptional person. Some of the posts were written directly to Terry, like letters sent to him in the beyond. One of those read, quote, Once again, parole has been denied for the individual that took your life and caused so much pain to those that love you. This time, the parole board said he has to wait three years to be heard again. When that time comes, your brother officers will be there again, like they have been in the past, to stop this individual from getting out of prison. You have not been forgotten. Reading these posts, it was heartbreaking. And I could see how, even all these years later, his friends and family would still be simmering with anguish and rage at the tragedy of it all. It also seemed almost cruel that year after year, Loftus's friends and family members would be expected to attend these parole hearings and share these kinds of sentiments, that they'd have to relive their trauma again and again. I also have to wonder what Terence Loftus himself would say about all of this. I wonder how he would want to be remembered, what he would want his legacy to be. Because after all, this was a man whose defining act was one of courage and decency. His biggest mistake, the thing that got him killed, was his inclination to help, to step into the fray when he absolutely didn't have to. For Ronnie, the whole situation is confounding. He accepts his responsibility for the death of Officer Loftus. He knows he's the one who pulled the trigger. And he says that he's done everything in his power to redeem himself. But as far as the justice system is concerned, there appears to be no real path forward. I'm not supposed to mature and be able to have the constitutional right of being restored to useful citizenship. The judge didn't leave me no room for that. He just wasted me. I'm wondering how in the face of being rejected for parole for 35 times and being in prison for almost half a century, like, how do you keep that faith and that hope alive? Well, I study two hours a day. I stay in the scriptures. I pray every day. I pray with other people. Uh, it's, 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 uh, <laughs> it's heartbreaking, especially when you lose family members down the line and to keep your faith. So... There's a scripture in there where it says what, what it's uh, Genesis 50, 20, where what man, man, man means for evil, that God means for good. And in the Bible, God is, uh, is a just God. It's just all justice. This whole exchange oddly reminded me of something that Bob Cooley once said to me. He said that in his mind, the world of justice was divided into man's law and God's law, and that he put little faith in man's law. I think because he saw it as arbitrary and fundamentally corrupt. But God's law, on the other hand, was pure and transcendent. And according to Bob, it still had meaning for him. And I kind of understood this. In a city like Chicago, where corruption and politics and gang violence and lingering class resentments all skewed the law of man, he almost had to grasp for something higher hope that true justice might exist elsewhere, in some better realm. And it was here that Ronnie's faith resided. Though, I wondered if he thought that this faith alone would actually get him past that parole board. What do you think your chances of being released are? I'm going to get released. I have faith in God that, that uh, I pray every day that he uh, put on the hearts of the just people, you know, to see the scenario. And that uh, they... Uh, don't address the politics of it and give the judgment by law. I'm not going to surrender myself. Oh, I'm going to die here. I'm not going to. I'm not going to go for that. I'm not. I'm not living that way. If you were released tomorrow, what's the first thing you would do? I would sit in the backyard, basically look up, see the sky, see the 
the stars at night, and the, the threat is over. So I came from a gang life. That threat never goes away. So the first thing I want to do is just go and just like, oh, man, you know, it's over. And then go go live the life from there. I got so much time left to live. Basically, go be a help that uh, humanity is supposed to do in the first place. Be a giver. I was a taker as a kid. I can't take back my my criminal activity as a kid. I can't take back. can't put the bullets back in the gun. can't do any of that. I can only go forward. This summer, Ronnie was moved to a new facility, a reentry center. Ronnie's attorney petitioned to have him moved there. He's there to learn some basic life skills, like how to write a resume and how to manage finances, skills that he would need if he ever makes parole. Ronnie is now 64 years old. He'll be up for parole again in November of 2022. This episode of Deep Cover was produced by Amy Gaines and edited by Karen Chikurji. Our managing producer is Jacob Smith. Original music and our theme was composed by Luis Guerra. Mastering by Jake Gorski. Mia LaBelle is our executive producer. Additional thanks to Jesse DeBartolomeo and Emily Horner, formerly of Injustice Watch and now at the Chicago Tribune, for her reporting on Ronnie's case. I'm Jake Halpern. Deep Cover is a production of Pushkin Industries. For ad-free listening and early access to upcoming seasons of Deep Cover, consider becoming a Pushkin Plus subscriber. You can find Pushkin Plus on the Deep Cover show page on Apple Podcasts or at pushkin.fm.